What we designed this presentation today, myself, Professor Alexander Passa and Entrit, to sort of give you an overview of the latest development in the assessment rules of biogenic carbon emissions and uptake, sort of summarizing the findings that we, we listed in the paper published in the special issue of the journal Buildings and Cities. So very much in line with what Professor Lutzkendorf just said, um, I think it's clear now that carbon metrics are indispensable basis for tracking, for evaluating, and for influencing buildings' GHG emissions. However, these metrics must be reliable and they must be based on scientifically recognized principles. But then again, to reach scientific consensus, we need to assure that certain methodological questions, such as how do we deal with biogenic carbon accounting, are satisfactorily solved. So the question remains, have we reached that level? And more so, what are the methodological questions that are still open in life cycle assessments of buildings? So I borrowed this list of methodological questions from the IEA EBC Annex 72 research project, which you can look into to get some more information on. And as you can see, there are a number of methodological questions still open and that must be addressed if we are to propose scientifically sound carbon metrics. And as you can see to the left-hand side of the slide, biogenic carbon accounting is one of them. Biogenic carbon, for those who don't know, is basically the, the, biogen the carbon that's stored within biomass-based products. And not only is biogenic carbon one of these methodological issues that is still open, it is also, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my mouse. It is also very intimately connected to a number of other methodological questions still open in LCA of buildings. But before we go into the methodological aspects of how to account for biogenic carbon, let us take a look at the bigger picture here, the global carbon balance. Now, carbon metrics and budgets, they sort of try to uh, predict or regulate our contribution to the disturbance of this global carbon balance. And this balance, as we know, is composed of flat, fast and slow carbon cycles. Biogenic carbon naturally is part of the fast cycle and fossil carbon is naturally part of the slow carbon. And these components of the global carbon balance, they maintain a steady concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, in the land, in plants and in the ocean. The thing is, if you have a change in concentration in one of these reservoirs, the effect is rippled throughout all the others. Building materials and buildings per se, they contribute to altering biogenic and fossil carbon balances. So they must be properly uh, measured. So considering that we acknowledge that we do influence into the disturbance of this global carbon cycle, and considering that we need metrics to sort of measure this and properly connect them with the budgets, the carbon that is still available for us to spend, let's say, um, our contribution to the Buildings and Cities Journal attempted to, to cover what methods are available to account for the biogenic carbon flows that happen throughout a building's life cycle. So to me, for me to just quickly contextualize the problem here, we, very, we have a very increased demand for biomass-based materials because we want to stimulate the uptake of CO2. We want to stimulate this increased uptake, which would happen in the raw material stage of a building's life cycle. But in order to properly measure this, we must address the balance of the CO2 that is uptaken and the CO2 that is emitted. So to do that, we need a full life cycle approach, as we know, and we also need to know when do these flows happen, when are emissions happening, and when is the uptake happening. And we do so through the modularity principle. We account for these flows exactly in the, li exactly in the life cycle stage in which they happen. But how? How do we model this in practice? So I'll walk you through the three options for assessment rules that we've identified that are available. So in this figure here, you see the three systems separated. We have the forest system, we have the building system, and we have the potential subsequent product system. And we follow here the modular structure of the European standard. I'm sure most of you know, but module A refers to the production and construction stage, BU stage, C end of life stage, and D beyond system boundaries. Let's say if wood is recycled. <clears throat> 
So in the zero zero approach, which is the first approach, we assume carbon neutrality. So you see there are no biogenic CO2 flows accounted there, but we do account for the methane emission at the end of life. And that's mostly because methane contributes more to global warming than CO2 specifically, but we assume carbon neutrality here. The second approach, also called the minus one plus one approach, it sort of aims to assess all the biogenic carbon flows that happen throughout a building's life cycle. So the uptake of CO2 that happens in the forest system is transferred to the building system and accounted as a negative emission in module A. Then all the emissions of biogenic carbon flows that happen at the end of life are also accounted for. And then you can also have the carbon being um, transmitted to the subsequent product system. Now, what's important to see here is that in each system, the carbon balance must be equal to zero. What's important to also state here is that there is a danger, let's say, of considering the carbon uptake only in the product stage and not at the end of life stage, which would significantly bias the results, as you will see further along this presentation. Now, there are some criticisms to this zero, zero and minus one plus one approach. And one of them is the fact that they don't consider the timing of emissions. And also they don't consider the forest rotation timing. So the solution proposed by the dynamic approach that you can see here, it considers the cumulative gradual uptake of CO2 in the forest. And then it also considers the difference in timing. So it properly positions the slow gradual uptake in the forest with the emissions that happen 50, 100 or 200 years after. It positions them against each other in a more proper way. So there are two ways for accounting for the tree rotation period in the dynamic approach. You can consider the tree growth before the harvest, as you see here in the picture, following the natural carbon cycle, or you can consider the tree growth after the harvest. So this way, you consider that all the trees that were harvested, they will start growing right after the harvest, and you account for this benefit in module D. So this allows us to consider when we have a very long rotation period of a forest and you have a building's life cycle ending before the rotation period actually ended. So you don't really have a sense of a carbon neutrality there. And this, this specific approach allows you to, to consider that. So let's see what the results would look like if we apply these three approaches to a same case study, which we did here for a timber building here in Austria. Now, you'll notice that using zero, zero or minus one plus one approaches, the total life cycle uh, GWP is the same, whereas when using the dynamic approach is a different result. While for zero, zero and minus one plus one, you have the final total GWP being the same, the distribution of the contribution of the life cycle stations is quite different, of course, because of the consideration of the uptake in module A and the release in module C. So interpretation of results is different, even though the final result is the same. In the dynamic approach that you see here, the result is bigger. And that's mostly because in this case, we considered the uptake after the construction and we considered a long rotation period. So it means that once the building reached its end of life, the forest didn't finish its rotation period. So we don't get the full credit for the forest growth. That's why it's bigger there. So to give you some remarks that we also listed in our contribution to the special issue, we assessed a bunch of standards that actually try to regulate the biogenic carbon accounting in LCAs of buildings, and most of them recommend the minus one plus one approach. EPDs, on the other hand, so far mainly follow the zero zero approach. At the component level, if you use one or the other approach, the variability is quite high, especially if you don't consider the emissions at the end of life of these materials. So it should be dealt with care. Also, the main critique to the zero, zero and minus one plus one approaches is that they don't consider the trees typology and they don't consider the difference in timing of emissions, which is why we advocate that the dynamic approach is the most adequate if we are to account for biogenic carbon emissions in building components and in the whole building level. I must highlight that if you consider the uptake in the production stage, we state that emissions shall be considered in the end of life stage to avoid biased results. So last, I think we can conclude both from what was said in the presentations before and from this one that carbon metrics can inform our decisions and actions, and especially if they're coupled with a carbon budget, they can show whether the goals set for a specific project are being met. But in order to really ground policy shifts, we need common, transparent and replicable metrics. And those will only be achieved if we have clear and science-based solutions for the methodological questions that are still open that was shown in the beginning of this presentation. If specific methods are developed, transparent descriptions must be made publicly available. And last, 
National statistics and building specific considerations must be better coordinated, as was mentioned by Professor Luskendorf before. So in these final seconds, I'd like to propose these questions that if you could please uh, comment on them in the Q&A session, that would be quite helpful for our discussion. What's your typical practice in the audience to account for biogenic carbon accounting? That's basically what I had to say. Thank you all.